Okay. So let's get started. This is the last WebRTC Working Group meeting of the year. It's December 14th. And I think we're going to have a full two hours ahead of us. So a bit about the IPR policy. We conform to the W3C patent policy and only people and companies that are listed on the page are allowed to make substantive contributions. Uh, we're going to cover the calls for adoption that went out and completed yesterday. Uh, UN will talk about whether to see encoded transform API. We'll then get into a few PRs and issues from over to CPC and over to see extensions. And the final 40 minutes or so of the meeting will be devoted to the call for consensus on Weber to C and B. All right, a little bit about the meeting. We do need a scribe. Do we have a volunteer? You don't have to get everything, just understand the decisions and then write them down. So we can talk about it. Someone got a volunteer. <laughs> we do need this, so if we don't get a volunteer, it won't be much of a meeting. Can I enlist you, Dom? Uh, I can't stay until the end, so if someone can... Oh, that would be not be good then. Um, we do need, because we're going to get into the Weber CND use cases and need to figure out, uh, need to write things down. Uh, any volunteers? Can we draft you, Ben? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, so nice it, it needs draft. to be on the IRC? Uh, uh, put, take note somewhere and then send them to me at the end, and I'll, I'll publish them somewhere. <laughs> So if you want to do that locally on a Google Doc or whatever, uh, the only thing we need is notes. So. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ben. All right, a little bit about the code of conduct. We operate under the W3C Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. So uh, it's fine to be passionate, but let's try to keep things cordial and professional. A little bit about the meeting. We are uh, still being recorded. so be on your best behavior uh, to get, we probably will need a Q. So we're going to type plus Q and minus Q. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Harold, can you run the Q? Okay. Um, okay. Cause I'm probably going to be talking a lot. Um, and if, uh, if you're talking, maybe Yanivar can run the Q, but let's, uh, I'll ask you to do it primarily. And then uh, ask, use headphones when speaking so we can avoid the echo and please state your name. Um, I don't think we'll need a sense of the room, but if we do, we can use polls. Just a reminder about document status, just because something's in the repo doesn't imply it's been adopted. That requires a call for adoption, which we're going to be talking about. Uh, editor's drafts don't necessarily represent working group consensus. We have an example of that here with the end of use cases, uh, but we try to run the call for consensus on the mailing list to determine that. Uh, we can merge PRs that lack it, and, and we did do that for Weber to CMD use cases. Okay, so here's what we have. Uh, we're gonna have, talk about the calls for adoption, the transform, as we said, and finally get into the use cases. So call for adoption. And um, actually, if Harold, you could also look at the time, we're gonna try to run this uh, to about 8.30 Pacific, so the, the half of the hour. Okay, so we had, uh, the first one is region capture. We had a CFA announcement that ended on December 13th. We had seven folks uh, for adoption, one with concerns, and then one objection. So we're going to talk about the concerns and objection. Um, so one of the concerns came from Jan Ivar. I don't know, Jan Ivar, do you want to speak to this? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, well, the slide covers as well. It's basically that uh, uh, we think this is a, is a good feature, uh, but we would. Uh, it seems better. Our preference would be to restrict this to get viewport media, which we're uh, 
we have uh, we owe uh, a standards document on, so we have some consensus about how to proceed there. So that's good, um, and because that that's a, a use case where that makes a lot of sense to us because the application has full control and direct control over the page, and they have uh, we can imagine applications and use cases where cropping and not entire not capturing the entire document it makes a lot of sense. It seems less good of a fit for get display media. Mostly because uh, we feel get display media has some uh, uh, use uh, security concerns in that it's not always clear to users the scope of what they're capturing. <clears throat> uh, and that we worry that this cropping feature uh, exacerbates the misunderstanding further in that you're not you're not just cropping uh, one document. You're not just cropping a part of one document. You're actually cropping the tab container uh, and, and all navigation on that page. <clears throat> and is that clear? It's already unclear. I get display media sometimes. Sorry about the dog. Uh, but uh, we worry that this is the wrong foundation to build a document cropping tool over, uh, on top of. Okay, thanks, Jenny. But we also had an objection from UN. Uh, do you want to speak to this, UN? Sure. Um... So I also think that there's a use case there, and uh, the current draft is, is addressing this with uh, the assumptions on uh, get viewport media or capture handle, basically. And get viewport media is fully un unspecified, so it's unclear how they would behave one with the other. And capture handle is also uh, fully unspecified, so it's unclear uh, how it will interact. And the idea that um, a single solution should apply to both of them, maybe, maybe not, but it's, it's really difficult uh, to reason about it, reason about this assumption that is in the draft, because we, we don't have capture handle, we, we don't have get viewport media. So I think we should be clear about the scope and there the scope is not clear. So it would be good to say, okay, if we really want to go for it, let's uh, focus on uh, supporting region capture in get report media or get support for region capture in uh, get display media plus capture handle and then have a solution. And then uh, we can be very specific and we can try to have a, a more uh, generic mechanism, you want to extend it to get report media later on, or on the contrary, from get report media to get display media. But currently, I, I feel like we, we're not in a position yet to, uh, I think we, we, we need to work on the foundation and then, then on that. But I'm fully uh, supportive of working on that. Okay, uh, actually, why don't we have uh, a little discussion? I don't know if there's anyone in the queue Um, Elad here, I'm in the queue, and the okay. CDM is also there. <laughs> there. You're first. Excellent. So uh, please forgive me if I... Uh, so this is my call, first call for adoption, so it could be, or at least the first one that I can remember right now. So if uh, I'm a bit off topic, or if I don't understand the procedure 100%, uh, please let me know. Um, so I would like to address both concerns and objections. Uh, number one, about Get Viewport Media. I agree that uh, this will be very useful with Get Viewport Media. Um, unfortunately, Get Viewport Media has been always in the pipeline for over a year now, and I think that we need to make progress. Second, I think that Get Display Media will always be interesting, and it will always be a venue by which some users are going to start self-capture. And I think that's why we uh, we would want to support it anyway. And I think that it's relatively easy to make sure that the mechanism works equally well for Get Viewport Media and Get Display Media. And I think the currently proposed mechanism does just that. Um, second, about capture handle, I disagree with you and some assertion that uh, that region capture requires capture handle. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, we're only pitching uh, region capture for self capture, and what you can do is you can just optimistically hope, uh, optimistically call crop two, hoping that the user indeed chose to capture the current tab, and you would just get an exception if he chose to, uh, if the user chose to. Uh, capture anything else because then crop two is just invalid as it's currently specified and in the future when we do want to expand this to also work for cross tab capture then we'll need capture handle and that's why we're not discussing that option just yet because capture handle is still upcoming mm. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Anyone else in the queue? Yeah, um, Tim Panton, I'm, I'm in the queue. Um, I wanted to ask, Yannivar, I'm trying to understand what the perceived risk is of doing this now. I, I, you're saying that there's a u potential user confusion, but this is, surely this just reduces the thing that, like, it reduces exposure rather than, like, the user has already agreed to share, to, to, to capture this thing, and the only thing this does is reduce it. I, got, I don't see what the risk is there. Maybe I'm missing something. I know that that's a good question, but the, it's hard to explain. But um, let me try again. The, uh, the the distance between what a user may think they're capturing and what they're actually capturing and what they're actually capturing increases here because not only are you, I think a lot of people already would be surprised to learn that when they share a presentation like this, uh, we're looking at a set of slides right now. I think uh, Bernard is presenting. If Bernard were to type a new URL in this tab and go to a different page, we would see that. Right. It's right. not not actually, uh, he's not actually, and his entire user interface experience is that, you know, you want to present, you click yes, and you get these thumbnails to pick from, and there's my slides, I see my slides, and I pick those. But you're not actually capturing the slides, you're, tap, cap, you're capturing the tab container that happens to contain that slide Google Doc document right now. So we're, we're capturing one level up. <clears throat> so if you hit the back button, for instance, if Bernard were to hit this back button in the slides presentation right now, he might accidentally share whatever he browsed before right. the meeting. All right. right. So now we're What's adding a point? cropping control on top of that. That sort of builds on the user's understanding that, oh, you're capturing a document. Now you can even capture just a sub part of that document. And it becomes even more confusing, I think, that you still have the gotcha of the back button. But if you hit the back button now, not only <clears throat> are you no longer uh, broadcasting that uh, small part of your page, but you're, uh, I'm guessing cropping would turn off and you will not hmm. capture the entire the page. Entire capture. Where you were the entire board. capture would actually uh, turn off because currently region capture pre -assumes, uh, presupposes that you're capturing your cell. So if you're, you know, both the capture and the capture, uh, the capturing entity and the captured entity are in scope at the same time, right? They go out of scope at the same time too. Mm. So, so I'm, so, I'm, I'm still not feeling that there's a bigger risk here. I mean, yes, there's a. I understand the risk of the back button, but I don't see how this increases it. Or if it does, it's because we presented the region wrong somehow. Because like. There's actually no need to tell the user which region that you're 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 cropping to. I believe, if I understand the proposal correctly, there is actually no additional security benefits from cropping. It merely um, because you're consenting, you're always consenting to capturing the whole tab. Always. Right. So, so, so I'm claiming it's security neutral. Like I'm, my my perception of it as being is is that it's security neutral, which is why I don't quite understand what the objection is. But I, I mean, I like... level, it's security neutral, but I, I feel that it's the wrong foundation. We're lulling users into the wrong mental model further. So uh, but, I would. But that's also would... true of tab yeah. capture with get display media, right? I no, mean, this was, I, I was, I was talking about confusion. get display media with tab capture. Yeah. And, and get viewport media, I think we're good because and get viewport okay. media, you are actually only capturing the document. Hmm. which has its own set of concerns if you you can't follow a link necessarily and have it captured so so i think uh, in get report media this makes perfect sense get display media i'm i'm also hoping that someday we can introduce a uh, site isolated capture to get display media which i presented a little over summer um so i think there's room for user agents to try to mitigate this oversharing risk uh in both models perhaps and that someday we can have Secure capture of pages where you would either get warned or capture would terminate if you navigate away. Uh, I would like to re-ask uh, Tim's question because 
uh, we're not talking about, uh, well, at least uh, we're, the proposal does not address get viewport media right now and does not address get display media for any type of capture, but rather only for self capture, in which case the back button would just stop the capture anyway. So it seems like any concerns of lulling the user into a false sense of security might apply if we one day try to expand this proposal to cross tab capture, but it does not apply for self capture. So, are you saying I, that um, I, it's I'm, a crop? I'm in here. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it seems that uh, the current proposal, as stated, is uh, stated in terms of get display media simply because that's what we have. Uh, that's what we currently have and can specify extensions to. Well, uh, get viewport media seems to take some, somewhat more time. Well, the current property of the current proposal is that it, since it's only capable of, of working in self-capture, it will uh, work only in self-capture. So navigation is not a security issue. Mm. Uh, I don't think I agree with uh, some of the other statements about uh, letting the user into into a false model it's it is what it is so uh, i think we should adopt this and uh, and uh, and iterate we should we shouldn't uh, uh, we shouldn't wait any longer hmm. uh, let me see then we have jan Ivar and yuen on the queue uh yeah, so I should point out that I did not actually object to this proposal. I also agree that uh, we should move forward. And, uh, but my concerns, uh, I believe there are unaddressed concerns in Get Display Media, and I see the value in Get Viewport Media. I was surprised to learn that, um, so you're saying this would only work for self-capture. So, But so far, self-capture with Get Display Media uh, still allows, uh, capture doesn't terminate if I then navigate, right? So. Well, are you saying that if the user uses no. this cropping feature, then the capture will terminate? No, I'm uh, saying that we're we're looking at the subset of get display media calls. So the subset in which the user chose the current yeah. in that subset, yes, capture terminates if you navigate because both the because both the capture and the because the capture is being unloaded. That's the important part. All right. <laughs> Right. So, so as, can, as long as we as long as we can't move media stream tracks off the off the tab, then uh, yes, the the media stream track will go away once you navigate. Right. No, no, that's a good point. Yeah. So perhaps we just note some of these secur uh, security concerns that apparently uh, slip by people. Put it in the document, and would that address your concern, Yanivar? Well, it will. For, it would for self capture, but I guess uh, we'll we'll have this debate again when we introduce capture handle. Right, right. And uh, and transferable media stream tracks. Yeah, hopefully not to service workers. So I think we're good there. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm in the queue, so um, I I want to hit first um, to state that uh, yes, the current only use is self-capture, which is something we, we dislike and we prefer not people go there. So that's the first thing. And uh, if we if we had to do something like that, my guess is that we would uh, probably not design an API where we are trying to define an opaque object that would be allowed to be transferable and so on. So a lot of the API design has uh, thoughts of where we are going because just capture and all, because maybe mm -hmm. we uh, get report media. And all of this is, is not available, is not a thing. So we, we are clearly trying to design something, um, some overwork that we plan to do. And I would really prefer that we uh, do the work first and then this one. Uh, my objection also lies in the scope of the work then, because uh, the scope of the work is really not clear to me. And that's something we, we need to precise. 
Um, Yuan, uh, you should be aware that this is already in origin trial for Chromium M98 and it is par perfectly functioning without get viewport media or capture handle and you can you know you can write a demo right now and enjoy it without any other yeah. uh and without any other features yeah, yeah. so we got seven minutes with in left in this segment and, yes and, so i uh, think we'd i'd like to go on to media capture transform that's okay. So uh, the CFA for that also ended December 13th, and there were basically eight for adoption, no objections. Uh, one of the adoptions had a concern. So this concern also was from UN. Do you want to talk to that, UN? Uh, sure. Uh, I was trying to um, provide a list of uh, if we're, if we're, how are we going to be successful with uh, Media Capture Transform if we are using the streams model. And uh, first, we need to have a good foundation for stream support. So there's a PR there, which is just uh, a rough proposal. So we need, as a working group, to put the effort to actually make sure that the stream spec and streams implementation will be updated, which is, uh, so that's something we, we need to put in, in the document. And also, more generally, uh, this uh, work there is the first one which is trying to uh, push for uh, streams for image manipulation. So far, all the previous examples of uh, image manipulations were callback-based, be, be it web codecs or shape detection API, uh, whatever. So we are branching now, and we are trying to say, okay, there's a better model, and uh, let's embrace this model, which means that if we go there, we would need to push uh, web codex folks and uh, over API designers like Shape Dictation API to consider uh, using streams as a foundation piece so that there's no mismatch in terms of API design. Uh, yeah, I just had one comment. Uh, you referenced the Shape Detection API, uh, UN, and I would note that this also includes face detection, which was what we discussed at the last meeting, uh, but does it uh, somewhat differently? Um, yes, so it's a, it's a post-processing step, so it's really a transform, right. while the thing we discussed was, hey, we already have the data, so let's just expose it. So, uh, um, yeah, just to, uh, just to comment that I think I think Web Codex made the wrong decision, and it was easy to write the adapter, I've already done it. So uh, I don't think that consistency with Web Codex is a big deal. Uh, the shape detection API. Oh, either they switch or they don't. Not my issue. Well, you know? you're trying to push for a model like promise uh, promises were done in the first place. So now you have uh, some some leadership, and you need to uh, accept it and push for promises and push for things basically. Yeah, I mean push by push by demonstration. Show that it's useful. Bernard, you have raised your hand instead of typing Q plus. Yeah, right. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, I understand the uh, push for consistency, but actually it doesn't feel that bad when you're writing code. So I actually kind of like the shape detection API. I'm not even sure how it would work as a transform stream because basically you're you're kind of giving it the, the individual video frame, although it's a, a, a bit, an image bitmap, um, and getting back a face detection. Like if this were in a stream, I don't, I'm not sure how it would work. Basically, you would still have to get the face detection on every frame. So it actually seems, that API seems pretty natural. Um, and uh, um, I also, as Harold said, I dis kind of disagree with the way Web Codex did it. But on the other hand, you know, I've also written transform streams in Web Codex, and it's not too terrible. Um, and that there are actually some things that are actually that work a little bit better in the current model, like if you have to skip frames or things like that in the middle uh, because the encoder is too backed up, um, it actually gives you a bit more control than streams would. So I actually don't feel that we. Sh I mean, I understand the consistency stuff is maddening especially when you have problems with things like memory allocation, like to get everybody to use the same model. And I think we're kind of stuck there. Um, but I, I'm not sure that we have to have strict consistency, although I would 
probably learn it would probably be a good idea to figure out how the working groups can coordinate because it seems like everybody's doing their own thing but <coughs> okay so uh, we should probably see if we have a decision here uh, uh, well i i i, I kind of think we do because uh we had no objections yeah so let's just record record the decision to adopt. but yeah um but we should uh you know keep on top of the stream stuff i guess you uh, yanivar was this your slide about oh uh, yeah lens? okay so uh, i can run over this one uh, and just to comment on what i agree about consistency i think that's going to take time uh, i think the best we can do is to push uh good apis that use streams and uh, for web codecs, there are, I've had, it's easy to shim streams on top of web codecs. And yeah. I'm happy to push for them to use promises as well. They had some good arguments against that I want to mention, which is for audio. There's not always a one to one between encode and uh, calls to encode and callback. So there's some small reasons there to perhaps not prefer right. streams. But this slide is, uh, I want to give uh, an update on progress since last month in the WhatWG. Um, They've been very um, responsive to our, our needs in this area. And uh, there's, um, I want to call out, uh, there's one PR already for fixing the um, avoiding buffering. Uh, and that's uh, to make high watermark zero work. And uh, basically, by uh, inventing a new method, which is still being bike shed with a writable. Con so the readable side of a transform can call uh, a, a function currently, you know, release back pressure or mark ready to basically tell the writable side, uh, I'm ready for a packet now. So it would work without buffers. So, so yay on that. And um, another PR uh, from UN, thank you uh, for providing an explainer that suggests a, a new stream type uh, tentatively called transfer to help uh, clean up objects that are both transferable and closable, which are two concepts that hopefully eventually might end up in WebIDL and maybe uh, in the stream spec for now. Uh, but basically, this would be the first use case for this would be video frames. So you can now make a transform stream that accepts a video frame and a controller, and you can access the video frame un uh, until you enqueue it to the controller. In which case, the video frame is transferred. Think, think move semantics if you're from C++. So it's move semantics for chunk basically, and then um, so you can write code that takes care of closing the frame, uh, but after um, but after it's been enqueued, you don't need to close it anymore because you don't own it anymore. And you can't also access it, which means you uh, avoid problems like A passing to B and then A mutating what was passed. Uh, so there's for transfer, uh, transform stream has both a readable side and a writable side. So there's a type field for that. And I'm also showing zero high watermark. So that's the current state of things. It's just an explainer at the moment. So we're um, still gathering feedback from other participants on that but it's it's encouraging because there's some concepts here that are, are potentially beyond um that are useful beyond just uh our needs for a ray buffer and things like that thanks yeah i, I just Please. had one question about the code you're showing here yanivar the e here right you just try the controller dot in queue that's really only an error in in queue why would that in queue itself is very unlikely to blow up so I don't think you're catching much of an error here. It's not like oh, an encoding, you. not an encoding error or anything that you're catching, right? Sorry, uh, no. Um, actually, I, I struggled with whether that should be inside or outside the try, but it's the line ahead, the comment that says JS can imagine there's some code right above that is accessing the video frame. So if any of that JavaScript code were to fail, the the proper pattern would be to remember to close the video frame in that case. Hmm. Uh, but at the point where you enqueue it, uh, once it's been enqueued. Uh, then the, the red comment below, JS cannot access the video frame here. The remaining code doesn't need to close the video frame anymore. Hmm. So, so this is sort of a, uh, to solve the lifetime issues of video frames by uh, having more explicit lifetime controls, which gets a little more complicated than using garbage collection, of course. But I okay. um, guess that's what, what we have to do here. Okay, so I think we're out of time on this segment. Um, and so we're going to go to the WebRTC Encoder Transform API, which is UN. We'll go to 850.
uh, sorry, uh, the 50 point on the hour. So you went. Okay. Um, I think we already discussed uh, this uh, topic at a meeting. So um, basically, uh, there are some needs for controlling video encoders, uh, either on the receive side or on the send side. And the, the most important uh, thing is to be able to generate a keyframe. Uh, on <coughs> the send side, it might be like when you're changing your uh, end to end encryption keys, like you're using S frame and you're using a new key, so probably you, you need uh, to generate a new keyframe at that, at that point. So it would be very handy if uh, JavaScript could say, okay, generate a key for me, uh, generate a keyframe for me, please. Uh, the second case is uh, maybe on the receive side, you have like multiple tiers uh, and you might want to, to switch from one tier to the other and uh, then you will uh, start sub subscribing and you want to ask uh, the uh, other guy on the other side to actually uh, trigger a keyframe. So usually um, the use agent might be able to do it uh, by sending uh, a full intra request. Uh, but it might be handy for JavaScript to also trigger that uh, outside of uh, the user agent heuristics. So I think that Harold and Bernard uh, uh, presented like uh, various proposals, and this one is like uh, um, building on, on, on top of uh, their proposal. So the API is uh, split into three parts. First, an API to generate keyframe at sender side. Uh, that would be exposed in, in script transformer where you are actually uh, manipulating frames like uh, doing end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so it's promise-based to state when you're thinking that the task is done and also to send errors. And it's taking uh, reads as input to be able to select uh, which encoders you might want to uh, request keyframes. So the example below there is uh, in the case where you're using a script transform for doing encryption, uh, whenever you're changing keys, then you might want to say, oh, let's go with generate a keyframe. And uh, you continue doing encryption, uh, getting new frames and so on. Um, the second API, next slide, is also exposed in script transformer and is only meaningful on the receive side. So let's say that at some point you, you want to send a keyframe request so you you send a fear so you want the user agent to send a full intra request for you so you call transformer.send keyframe request there there's no parameters because uh, it's up to the other side to know exactly which encoder to actually uh, use and it's promise based as uh, an error mechanism as well uh, i was not sure whether it should be promise based or not but for now that's uh, the current proposal um, and the third slide, um, there were some requests that uh, on the at the sender side, so main thread API, that you, you would be able to generate a keyframe. And some people are apparently doing that by using replace track or muted or muting tracks and so on. And uh, it might be better to have an API that um, uh, deprecates all these um, heuristics and we can ensure that uh, it will actually generate a keyframe. Um, it's the same um, prototype as the transformer case and basically it's the same algorithm. So it's, uh, it's just a convenience mechanism to uh, generate a keyframe without having to create a transformer just for it. So I guess the main difference from Harold's original proposal is, is you uh, return undefined as opposed to a a timestamp, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I was not sure exactly what was the purpose of a timestamp in the transformer case, because in the transformer case, you're grabbing frames. So you know exactly which one will be a keyframe and, and its timestamps. And at the center side, I was not sure what would be the use of the timestamp as well. So that's you why- want to comment, ha Harold? Yeah. yeah, so uh, the reason why I added the timestamp time originally was that uh, when you generate the keyframe, or when you're asked to generate the keyframe, and you again get three frames, uh, when you you have to choose to choose which key to encrypt the, each frame with, and so uh, you would normally think that you would 
would have to generate to use the old key for the for the ones previous to the keyframe and then mm. the new key for the keyframe you asked for. I got a little bit confused in my head about whether uh, whether there was a case where you could get the keyframe uh, where uh, you could get a free keyframe ahead of the one you asked for so that you would uh, not uh, not start encrypting the right key on the right keyframe. And that's where, why I added a timestamp, just to have a, un, have a unique identifier for the keyframe that is a result of your request. Mm, right. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, in the next slide, there are like some uh, areas where I'm not sure, like if you resolve a promise, uh, does it relate, which, which frame does it relate to? Like when uh, will you actually resolve a promise? And uh, right, right. We, we need to define that and it's not really defined in the PR. And uh, my rough proposal would be that, uh, yes, you can have cases where um, you're requesting a keyframe and the US agent uh, a millisecond before decided that, yeah, oh, it's five minutes, so now I need to generate a keyframe. And then the keyframe order is arriving and you generate the second keyframe like three, uh, three frames after uh, the first keyframe. And I'm not sure it matters, uh, but maybe it matters. So we, we need to, to right. dig into that. Uh, so my rough proposal there was to resolve the promise when the first keyframe gets enqueued in transformer.readable. So in that case, we, you would resolve on the first keyframe, even though it's not really you that actually generated it. Um, mm. Maybe we can do something else. Um, it's it's really up uh, to uh, these cases. Before or after? There is no when. So you you enqueue you you post a task to enqueue, and in this task in this task where you enqueue to the transformer dot readable, you would resolve the promise. Okay, so you resolve the promise after after enqueuing the frame. Mm, yeah. Or, or be just before. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, uh, because uh, because the the resolution of the promise is likely to to uh, to contain code that read tries to read the frame. So it's important to know whether it's there or not. Yeah. So my guess is that you would resolve the promise first, then synchronously enqueue the frame, and then in terms of promise, uh, if you if you did then and so on, it's the uh, generate keyframe promise callback that would be called first, and then the uh, read uh, chunk that would be called second, yeah. maybe in the same uh, in the same task. Uh, I'm always mixing up uh, promises and events and how they resolve. I was <laughs> I was uh, uh, I'm uh, not sure that's uh, that that's uh, that's a an enqueue task there. This. We can, uh, they, but this is uh, uh, this is solvable in uh, writing careful prose after we accept the proposal. Yeah, so, so there are additional issues like or small details like when the API rejects, uh, like for audio senders and receivers, that does not make real sense. Real sense. And um, to me, generate keyframe, for instance, on sender side should not drop frames it should not the next frame should not be like a keyframe uh, i think we, we maybe we agree with that uh, i'm not quite sure but that's something we can discuss so there, there are like, like all sorts of details that we need to uh, iron out uh, to get like a, a fully specified behavior but uh, i i think that it would be good if uh, we can discuss like the, the rough proposal uh, first and then we can explain the details Okay. So I have, uh, uh, so I think I have Bernard and Tim in the queue now. Right. So uh, I would say I generally support this uh, work, and uh, I do. I do understand now Harold's concern, um, and my personal view is I think it's it, the promise should resolve uh, relative to the new keyframe, not not a previous one, because that's a little uh, it's a little bit confusing, and they're. There might be use cases, as you said, they're a little bit different from the encrypted transform case. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you would want to know when when the keyframe you asked for gets generated, not not a previous one. Tim. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit nervous about the timestamp. Maybe we can cover this 
in when we get down to the detail later. But I just wanted to flag up that some of the SFUs will, as opposed to asking the encoder to generate a new keyframe, will send you one that they've cached recently, mm, which right. would have an old timestamp on it. So whether the timestamp is a good marker is I'm not clear in my head yet. Yeah, I think we really need to dig into those cases where there might like, is it important that uh, if there are two keyframes generated, uh, you resolve on the first or on the second? So that's something we, we need to understand precisely. Okay, so in terms of next steps, is it fair to say the next step is maybe to uh, revise uh, a little bit UN and then to go to a call for consensus? Is that is that the next step? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, what 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 should we revise? Is it the, the timestamp that we should revise or? Well, I, I, I think generally the stuff we've been just talking about is uh, clarifying so the, exactly. Yeah. So the, we, should, we should get the, I, I think we have more, more or less accepted uh, said that yes, this this looks good, mm. and uh, when we should make it into a pull request, then then we should uh, do a call call for consensus on on, on the uh, either either merge and uh, merge to extensions and uh, right. either merge or just or call for consensus before merging. I'm not sure about that. It's in it, okay. so the PR is in encoded transform. There's already PR. It's in right? yeah. It's not all details, but it's in encoded transform. I don't know if yeah. it um, changes the call for consensus or things like that or not. I don't think it changes the process much. Uh, okay. So I mean, I guess the question is, I think we can we leave this up to the editors, Harold? They can merge it and then we do the CFC. It might be yeah. easier to do the CFC if you have the, the text because someone can read rather than a PR. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's next step is next uh, next step is merge to the encrypted transform draft and then run a CFC. Yeah. Okay. Um, can, can I? Yeah, you win. Uh, sorry, Yanivar. So uh, I'm not sure we should merge it before we have consensus. Though, is there? Can we use PR preview and, and do it that way? You can always. Well, you can't measure consensus without a CFC. You mean discuss it among the editors before merging? Uh, I think run a, run, a run a CFC on the on the PR. On the PR preview, oh, which okay. shows a change in context, but sure. not okay. either. We could do that. If that was the only concern, I mean, we could solve it that way. Yeah, yeah, that's a possible way forward. Okay. Both are possible. Thanks. Okay, uh, so we can put that down, run a CFC on the preview, and then uh, see what we get. All right, we have a little bit, a uh, little bit extra time, so we're now going to get into the uh, Warbridge CPC and Warbridge C extensions PRs. Um, and first, uh, Yanniver will talk about Pack Timer, and then we'll get into a few extensions issues and PRs. So, you win. Um, sorry, Yanivar. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, there was an issue filed uh, here, where and um, uh, this came up when we're doing a uh, content security policy. But there's actually a general problem here where the spec there's an RFC eight eight six three that talks about a pack timer, which is a, w a way to update the ICE agent to wait a minimum amount of time before declaring ICE failure even if there's no candidate pairs uh, and all checking has failed. And this delay provides enough time for, to, for the discovery of peer reflexive candidates. Uh, this is when uh, you've generated a local candidate and the other side was able to, to um, successfully complete a stun request that, that gets to you. And in that case, uh, so, so the current spec was going to fail too soon and not waiting the appropriate time to allow for peer reflexive candidates. And uh, so, so that's the first thing that the PR does, is to add language that says, um, the condition for failed is all these other things. Um, we've finished gathering. We've received an indication that there are no more remote candidates. We've finished checking all pairs. 
and all pairs have either failed or lost consent and either zero local candidates were gathered or the pack timer has expired. And um, so with that uh, change, we're now mentioning the pack timer and the reason for, but there's an uh, uh, exception there uh, because the pack timer is by default, I think uh, 39.5 seconds. So it's a 40 yeah. second wait. But um, in the case, I think uh, just a new birdie pointed out this, if you have generated local zero local candidates, you know for a fact that you know you're not going to get a pair of flexible candidate because there's nothing uh, for the stun server to hit. So in that case, we can skip the wait and go to failed immediately. Uh, and that that has some advantages in that we get um, an instant failure path in the common situation where both uh, it's not common, but in the in the case where both peers generate zero candidates, you can go to failed immediately. And that is useful for CSP because uh, you, if you block WebRTC you, through CSP, you now have a failure path that we can reuse uh, for content security policy because there was an interest from the content security folks uh, to to not throw in the constructor, but, but instead use the natural network failure path in our spec. And we didn't have one until then because um, it should also mention the browsers here today they don't all go to failed here, so we need to add some platform tests as well. So that's the first part. And there's a second part. Uh, we also added a new um, arrow to the transition diagram to update the state diagram to cover failure from zero candidates because uh, you're in state new until you receive one candidate and then you go to state checking. So if you never get any candidates, the state diagram made it look like uh, we shouldn't go to failed, even though the all the uh, pros, the normative language, I believe, says we should. And that's it. Yeah, so so the last uh, transition would be when you have, when gathering is completed and you have, have the, still have zero candidates. Yeah. Yeah. OK, any objections to this? Makes more sense. OK, the uh, minute should show that PR 2704 has consensus. OK, so issue uh, 47, this relates to RTB header extension encryption with Cryptex. So Cryptex has completed working group last call and ITF ABT core working group. It's currently in revised ID needed. Uh, we had talked about the API proposal in September of 2020. And the basic idea was, um, uh, I think HBOS wrote this, was to encrypt RTP headers on all the M sections uh, within a bundle or none of them. Uh, you always attempt to negotiate Cryptex uh, if you support it. And then you have uh, RTP header encryption policy and configuration, which can be negotiate, uh, which says uh, send unencrypted if the other side doesn't support it or require. And if the other side doesn't support it, you fail. Um, and then uh, we have a. Uh, attribute encrypted encryption negotiated that tells you whether you've negotiated or not on that transceiver. So here's the rub. Um, the ITF Cryptex spec marks this as bundle transport. Um, and that means that if Cryptex attribute is present, it must be in all M lines of the bundle group, but uh, all M lines don't need to be uh, identical when you're not bundling. So Harold brought up the following issue is that this creates an interop problem potentially with non-browsers because it's, it's transport not identical. Um, and without identical, we can't reject the following offer, which would be cryptex on audio, but not video. Um, I would note that I actually brought up this same issue when I reviewed the cryptex document. Um, and it, it, uh, I didn't understand this particular use case because, um, what you're saying here is that you can't receive cryptex on video, but why would you not be able to do that if you can do it on audio? It didn't make sense to me. Uh, you, because you, the code has the ability to do it. Why would you decide not to do it on video? Uh, so it was a little confusing to me, and I asked why it shouldn't be identical rather than transport. Uh, but I, I guess the authors didn't uh, didn't address that. Um, so. Uh, 
I guess my question is, what should we do about this? I mean, uh, I guess, Harold, uh, do you think this is going to cause enough of a problem to, to prevent implementation in browsers? I have not analyzed it that far. OK. Uh, well, my other question for you, Harold, is do you think anybody really needs to do this? Like on video, but not audio, or audio, not video? I have to twist my head hard for uh, for for to to write up a use case to get a use case for it. It's uh, it's kind of the, it it would have been the, if you have a middle box that insists on reading your headers, but only for a video. Yeah, I didn't understand that use case, uh, Harold, because like if your middle box does cryptex for audio, why couldn't it do it for video? Uh, it's a different story whether the thing behind the gateway can do it or not, but why would it, why would the middle box care? It doesn't have to send cryptex, you know, to the video conference or whatever. It just has to do it on its own side. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand the use case either. No. Um, Uh, I, think, I, I think it's uh, I think it's very unlikely that we will encounter, encounter this, and we could just reject it. Mm -hmm. uh, if if the yeah. yeah, so um, the question is what we should do. I mean, one thing we could do is uh, since this document is still in revised ID needed, someone could post to the working group, you know, as themselves, and just say, "Hey, I don't I don't get this." Um, why is it why is it not identical instead of transport? Um, another thing is the working group. If we have consensus that we want it to be identical, we could send a liaison or something. Uh, say, hey, this is giving us headaches. Uh, any thoughts on what we ought to do? Posting as individuals is more idea fish. Tim. Mm. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say it feels like something um, from the um, three GPP people who tend to split video off from audio, right? Quite early on, but I, I can't see why it would matter to us. Okay. So uh, what? What is the next step for the minutes? Harold, do you have a suggestion? So, uh, I can take on sending a note to the AVT core list saying, uh, I have this problem case. Do you really want us to support this? OK. Okay, that, that sounds like a good resolution. Uh, then we'll wait for the response and uh, figure out uh, what to do in the PR. Yeah. Okay, next one is issue 69. Um, by, by the way, in between, Errol had a question. Um, yes, can you hear me? I've got spotty, a spotty internet connection here. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, yes, so I didn't uh, fully understand how the call for adoption for region capture concluded. Well, there was one objection uh, and the rest were approved. So I know, Dom, can you say something about what it means to have an objection and, and what the working group needs to do? Uh, well, the chairs uh, are empowered to decide. My, my sense from the discussion is that we probably need to iterate some more in issues and email discussion to figure a pass out of the objection. Um, I mean, uh, that would be my suggestion to the chairs. Um, well, my my personal view is that uh, uh, some of the object some of the objections, though possibly not all, uh, could be addressed just by clarifications in the document, like uh, some of the stuff you were talking about a lot, about the security and how things would turn off if you navigated to another ta another page or something like that. Um, and also the relationship to cap capture handle that it actually doesn't have the dependency. 
Uh, I agree completely, and I also think that if we adopt but don't, you know, there is no call for consensus yet, that's going to make it easier to iterate on both this as well as uh, right. capture handle. Like, it's right. kind this of is... difficult to, to keep both of them on ice. Yeah, well, it wasn't a call for consensus. It was just a call for adoption. Mm -hmm. So the bar is a little bit lower. Does that answer your question? Um, not fully. Uh, so uh, I guess... I Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. I, I think basically uh, you should do the revisions and then I guess the chairs will discuss what the next step is. Is that what you're saying, Don? Um, yes, I mean, ultimately the chairs have to assess whether the threshold of consensus is enough to move forward with adoption. Okay, so, so you're saying that uh, in the case where the, the work group is not, not anonymous, but uh, strongly tilted, then uh, the work groups just get to make the call. Yes, you have to assess the rough in the rough consensus. Yes. Okay. Okay, it's on our lap. All right. Thank you. So back to issue 69. This was uh, about P time. And originally in the adaptive P time description, which was in section nine, it mentioned setting P time, uh, but P time itself wasn't defined, the attribute. Uh, and so what we did in our in PR 89 is we removed the P time reference to not have it refer to something that didn't exist. Um, and this issue said, hey, should we add this back and actually add P time to the document instead of having a dangling rest, uh, reference? And so the question really is, uh, are the working group participants uh, supportive of adding P time? Um, and if we add it, will actually is anybody interested in implementing it? And just for reference, this is the PR. It's not particularly complicated. It basically adds a p-time attribute to RTC, RTP encoding parameters and said, um, you know, duration of media represented uh, by a packet in milliseconds and just adds back the, the reference uh, in adaptive p-time to p-time and basically says you can't do both. If you do adaptive p-time, you can't set p-time. Uh, so want to open the floor to people uh, commenting. Do you want p-time? Will anybody implement it, et cetera? Tim? Yeah, so, so I want it. Um, there are situations where, uh, where you know something about the network or you know something about the one end of the system where it would be really useful to wind the p-time up to like 60 milliseconds to re drastically reduce the packet load. Um, and, and that's there's a load of networks where that's a really valuable thing to be able to do. And at the moment, the only way to do it is to manage the STP. Um, and so adding P time back, I think, would remove my last reason for managing STP. That's the winner itself. <laughs> we'll find you another reason to manage, Tim. Well, not at the moment, right? I, I, I genuinely have, this is the last one that's hanging on. So uh, hopefully we, we, I get away with it after that. So would this, would this be an extension or would it be in the, a main doc patch? Well, at the moment, this is a PR to Weber to see extensions. I guess uh, in the theory that it would stay there until somebody implements it, because it, you we wouldn't want to patch something uh, and have it not be implemented. I would, I would be happy to have it in the, in extensions. Let's do it. Okay. Are there any objections to merging this PR? Um, I think it probably ought to. If it is merged uh, without implementation, it probably should have a note saying it hasn't. You know, it's. Uh, it hasn't been implemented, but now we can see what happens. Okay, sounds like we have consensus to merge it with with the note. Cool. Okay, cool. All right. So now we're uh, into the last portion of the meeting, uh, which is whether to see NB use cases, uh, and I think we're going to have a good good discussion here. Okay, so let's talk about the results of the CFC. It was one of the more complicated CFCs, hopefully that we'll ever have. It ended yesterday. Um, and here are uh, uh, the result on the use cases. We had three use cases, 
uh, low latency peer-to-peer -peer broadcast, decentralized internet, and reduced complexity signaling. Uh, there were three approvals and uh, one objection for each one. Um, and we'll go more into the use cases and then also into uh, the requirements. So the first one was low latency peer-to-peer -peer broadcast. Um, I had a question whether it was what, well, first, I guess first what we mean by low latency, but also whether it might have value for non-low latency, like we've seen peer-to-peer -peer caching with the data channel being done to extend HLS, kind of like a, an enterprise cache. Um, my other question was, what DRM today in, in the web is transport independent. So, uh, you know, was the requirement already met or is there something else that, that we need to meet it? And I guess Harold, uh, who also expressed support, said he interpreted broadcast as semi-simultaneous unidirectional delivery of the same audio video content to uh, a thousand plus users. Um, and then Yadivar said he thought it was too broad and confusing asked what broadcast meant. I think Tim also responded that it was the multi, uh, multiple uni unidirectional real-time streams with multiple viewers watching a concert or sports event or church service. Um, and, uh, and we have seen that implemented with the data channel in particular. And some of these do use DRM uh, that already exists. And so then Yanivar said, does this require DRM support in the WebRTC media stack or in the data channel like something beyond like what we already have? Uh, do you need to send real-time media over data channels? And, uh, and I added, you know, in one direction, in both directions. Um, and does it require support for higher latency non-real-time media like peer-to-peer -peer caching? Um, so uh, is there anyone who wants to comment on this? So, Tim, you beat me. I'll, I'll just cue myself. Tim, cool. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I think this is badly phrased, and 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 uh, I didn't actually in, mentally include data channel use cases here, but but maybe that's uh, an omission that I shouldn't have made. I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Um, I think the only objection I have to some of these is I. I I think beyond a thousand, I'm not like there are smaller churches who might still want to do this. So <laughs> right. it's like you know, let, let's not put a number on 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 that. I mean, you know, more than your average. Uh, I try to want to try and distinguish it from video conferencing, um, but but I think it's it's you know a thousand is a, a difficult number. I wouldn't wouldn't want to go that far. I think the DRM thing is is. I genuinely don't understand what the requirements are here, and that's probably why it was as, as weakly written as it was. But I feel there is something here that we need to understand and support. And I and I I don't know how we um, how we approach that. Um, I think get in experts who who can explain why they're not using WebRTC. Basically, it's like the yeah. thesis of this. I think. So yeah, that, that's not super helpful, but um, that's kind of the way I saw it. Yeah, I, I came up with a, so now, it, now I'm, in the, I'm in the queue. Uh, and uh, I came up with a 1,000 number just because when you have 500 people, you can just run an ordinary video conference. So right. not quite ordinary, but, but it works. It's, got, it's present technology, there's nothing new here. So I put up, put up the beyond one thousand as uh, as uh, to get to think that there might be new technologies in, that needed to be involved and seem as simultaneous unidirectional because we don't uh, we're not talking about uh, support supporting a, a mode where we where we talk back but I think we should leave the RM out of it. And uh, whether, whether it's a data channel or not, that's uh, part of the solution or part of the problem. So I, I think we should revise this quite uh, dramatically. But uh, we should adopt the use case. Bernard? Yeah, I also support adopting the use case, and I agree with uh, what a bunch of what Harold has said. Um, I will say what I think the use case is, which I think is close to what what's been suggested here, which is, 
I've seen this, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, Tim, the concert, the sporting event, that kind of thing. I think it, I think that's actually the core of it. Um, the big question in my mind is the latency, and you used the term low latency. I think that's the right term because I think you're, uh, you're not talking about a, an ultra low latency case here, like a gaming scenario. I think you're talking about something which doesn't have quite the latency uh, requirement even of conferencing. Like well, I'm thinking of also a very large company meeting, like 100,000 people in a company. Um, and what I've seen happen here is basically uh, it is it can be done a bunch of ways, uh, but basically one way is to do the data channel. Think of it as a data channel to a gateway and then, then branch out with peer-to-peer -peer caching. Uh, in the data channel, you can get to that kind of 100,000 scale by uh, uh, more easily than you could with WebRTC. I've also seen DRM supported for this, but it doesn't require anything new. That is, the way it's done is you send containerized media, get the keys with EME. It looks exactly like uh, the DRM in HLS. Um, I have heard some complaints about that, not with MSE specifically, but when you, uh, so by the way, the rendering is done typically with MSC or would be done maybe with MSC v2 and RTC data channel, uh, like in workers. Um, the thing here is the, the complexity comes in when, if you want to use web codecs, and there is discussion in the media working group about how that would work because then it wouldn't be containerized. But that's not in, we don't have to worry about that in WebRTC. I think we should most, mostly focus on the transport. Um, and with respect to some of uh, Jan Ivar's uh, uh, questions, um, this is done uh, uh, with the latency lowered by, by changing the congestion control on the server. So there's nothing in the RTC data channel that has to change. Um, and since it's unidirectional, it, it wouldn't be both directions. Um, anyway, so I, I th at least I think I understand what, what I, my interpretation of the use case, and maybe it's close to what Tim and Harold had in mind, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah so, so I, I'm, I'm glad I'm hearing a lot of things that this could be improved. Uh, the use case could be clarified a lot. I think the difference is that uh, I think we should object to the use case until those improvements have been made so it's clear what we're committing to. Um, and uh, also WebRTC is being used for a lot of things, uh, but it still has a scaling problem. I think we should be careful to uh, actually commit. I don't know that we should commit to an actual number and say that you know right, right. we should support a thousand or anything like that. Um, as far as sending media over data channels, uh, but yeah. So to clarify what's on the slide, what what I said about DRM was that I just want to make it clear that um, I worry that the use case is so broad that it might lead people to believe that we're asking for a lot of these things. So I want to clarify that I do not think we should support DRM in WebRTC, media stack or data channel. Um, well, it is, it isn't, it, there's a difference between adding something, it is supported over data channel, supported over every transport with a current architecture. Sure. So you, you're saying don't, don't add, I, we're, I, not, I, we're not committing to anything new here, I guess. Right, we're not adding DRM specific features. You can send right. media over data channels today, um, you can, as you pointed out, if you're server to client, you can even send low latency media. You just can't uh, upload from client to server low latency media because that would require. Well, you, you're you're still you can do that, but you're still bound by the congestion control that right, we right. support today. So I just want to be careful that there's a lot of things we could commit to, and I worry that uh, we should mm -hmm. have uh, since the spec is at uh, recommendation now, we should have very narrow use cases for things that we actually anticipate adding features for. So in terms of the next steps on this use case, I think what we've heard is it needs like a, Tim, would you be willing to do a PR to revise it to address some of these concerns? Yeah, I, I'm going to need going to need input because as I said, I, there are particularly the DRM stuff. I, I, I simply don't understand um, how these things work. So I, I will need help yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, so uh, Okay, so I guess the first step is for you to do a PR and then we can comment on it and move forward uh, with that. Yeah. And Randall, okay. Randall is in the queue. Okay. And has to unmute. Yep, yeah, there we go. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, also on the Yanni Bar stuff, uh, comment on the data channels. Uh, 
this is best mentioned peer to peer, but Bernard was talking about well, you can do real time if you have the if you modify the server's congestion control, but that wouldn't be peer to peer. Just a, well, just a it's note. Still running over, still running over ice, you know. So it looks like peer to peer, but yeah, right, it wouldn't but, be done in the browser. But, but this says peer to peer, so right, right, right. So that's di that's different than what you were talking about for the very low for low latency. So if you know if you're not you know if you want low latency and peer to peer then there's some right. issues to deal with. Yeah. But I guess so, Tim that's you don't think that that's a requirement at least for the broadcast case, right? You don't have to modify the the where, the browser implementation of the data channel. Um so I think the peer to peerness is orthogonal from whether one end is a browser or not. Like there are a bunch of devices out there that aren't servers, but that also aren't browsers that might be the origin of this. Like you might put a super duper webcam in your church and have your 700 par parishioners watch it. Um, there's no servers involved. It's peer to peer, but you know, uh, but yes, you can mess with the congestion control algorithm in that in that super duper webcam. Hmm. Yeah, I would call that a server, but that's just a, it's a definitional thing. Yeah, well, no. So my distinction is that it's probably behind that, and it won't have it won't have doesn't need to have a public IP address. Yeah. So, like that, that's my line for whether it's a server or not. That's probably a bad um, line of distinction, but yeah, I, I don't know. So my my big reason for saying uh, 1000 was that if we, we have a solution for peer-to-peer -peer broadcast and it doesn't scale to 1000, it's not worth it's it's not right. worth doing. Right. So anything that scales to 1000 will also work for 20. But uh, we should aim higher. Yeah, I mean, typically the the limits for a lot of these conferencing solutions is around a thousand, or you know, so it has to be has to be bigger. Okay, so next use case was decentralized internet, uh, and uh, the discussion there was around service workers. Uh, Harold supported it and said that if a service worker can create a peer connection, uh, then you can do it. And then Yanivar questioned. Uh, the, whether this was just about data channel and, and web workers or it was about uh, R2C peer connection and service workers and whether that was a little bit much to ask for and whether there were alternatives. Um, comments? So um, the use case, well, I, I, yeah, I, I, I I'm, again, I'm slightly struggling with the with it, it, um, dragging out the use case, and I think it would be good to get some expert input on, on this. But but the feedback I've had from people who are in the kind of decentralized messaging space is that they want to be able to effectively receive messages in the background when when the user currently doesn't have a tab open, mm. um, okay. and 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 that is why we're in the service worker. Is it just the data channel or is it the peer connection as well? Well, I mean, they only need a you data need channel and it could potentially have been created in, in a tab. But the problem is that we've defined the lifetime as being the lifetime of the tab that it came from. And so right. like, it's gone then. So, um, I, was, I think I was in the queue next. Um, the yeah, I mean, I, I'm I am also concerned about the work to to put all of peer connection into service workers. Um, that's not trivial, um, and um, and then if we do put it in there, that's going to open up some interesting um, additional security, privacy, et cetera, um, stuff that need, will need to be thought about as well as resource usage in, in the browser. Um, 
ironically, I'm now on the workers and storage team at Mozilla <laughs> so, and been working on service workers. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, but uh, I, I think before we were to do that, there would have to be some discussion around what are the implications of mo of putting the full stack in there uh, uh, for for browser than for users and the resource usage. Um, Tim, you mentioned having some of the decentralized people come to the working group. I know we've had them. We've had a lot of questions around some of the requirements for ICE, like in some of the other use cases. Um, do you know those people <laughs> well enough? Uh, I mean, I could I could certainly ask uh, ask one or two and see if they they'll come along. Um, I um, yeah, I mean, I'm I can ask around and see see who can who can. Uh, who who would accept an invite if we made one? Um, I can certainly do that. Uh, I think it's an. In, I mean, I want to emphasize. I think it's an interesting space, and there are there are people who are like doing ugly things in iframes at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and it would be nice to avoid that. Yeah, one. Yeah, one thing I, I do. There are some. As I'm thinking about it, there are real, some some real concerns here. Once you have this stuff running entirely headless, uh, without any uh, user visible control, right. effectively service workers are totally hidden from the user. Mm. Um, and you know, I mean, in theory, yes, you can get to them if you know exactly what to look at and so forth in a browser. But effectively, the user never knows they're they're there. Um, which means once it gets installed, it can be doing anything forever. For example, you put this in there, then people who want to run peer-to-peer -peer caches can leverage everyone's, all they have to do is have you browse to some site they control once, and then forevermore they can use your bandwidth and storage to do caching. Uh, so that yeah, would that, be that's, a that's kind of the point. I mean, <laughs> right, but, of... without, but without any, but but the thing is, you know, so I, I on my low end laptop with my metered internet connection, I'm providing this to everyone without ever having been told I'm doing it. That's the thing. There's no consent here. I I, I mean I I do totally agree that there are a set of risks here we have to mitigate and manage and and like there's no question about that. But I think there's enough of a prize there that it's worth thinking about thinking about but i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't agree to accepting it as a as a go as a as a use case at this point without some real deeper thought about what the implications are well can we decouple the use case from the way that we're going to solve it because i think it would it's it'd be good to at least indicate some acceptance from the group that like this is a use case that we want to at least somehow address, and 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 I agree that we haven't come up with a way of addressing it that's in any way satisfactory. But I can, I think it would be nice to kind of signal to the decentralized folks that yeah, okay, we're at least looking at this. Well, perhaps uh, I have my entire I have issues with the entire decentralized folk in general, but that's separate. Uh, yeah, well, we're, uh, yes, there's there's a. But there's an there's a kernel uh, of something interesting there as well. I, I understand. Then I understand the the wish to move away from everything controlled by a few people. But that's a said that's a separate conversation. Um, so you know, I think it, it, I think if we were to signal interest or acceptance of the idea, general idea, we would have to make make sure there's some very clear caveats as to, attached to that. So in terms of next steps, uh, could we actually try to get the decentralized people at the working group to kind of make the case and maybe uh, dis discuss this? Because I, I personally feel like I don't understand this space well enough to even understand the motivation entirely. And certainly with ICE, I think it's gone over my head. Okay. I don't quite understand um, the changes needed. I, I noticed Yanivar is in the queue as well. Yeah, okay. Yanivar? Well, uh I was just gonna, maybe another way to approach it was to compare it to fetch. I mean, I understand you can use fetch in service workers today. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'd say as a devil's advocate, then, you know, what are the differences between asking for peer to peer on one end and on the other end, going back to the, the decentralized people uh, 
can't you can you somehow uh, solve your use case using fetch? But I, I guess you know in a sort of semi centralized way. I guess that's the problem. Yeah, it's the centralization, and and in fact, in some cases, there's there's a desire to take a fetch from the active tab and translate it into a peer to peer request that goes out over over some sort of decentralized fabric. Seems like that. Seems like that. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to Panan's point, yes, I, I will try and dig up um, uh, one or two people who would would agree to an invite and and, and ask them, um, uh, get get them get them to give some background as to what their problems are with using the existing uh, infrastructure and and how what they would want and and what limitations they would accept. Uh, Harold, do you have any other comments? No, I think this is uh, adequ adequate coverage, and and that that the way we know one solution to this problem: just declare pay connection uh, instantial in a in a service worker. We know that this uh, solution comes with lots of forms, and so. Uh, we should add the use case, and uh, then uh, and then we should work on solutions. Saying uh, describing the solution in the use case is is not not the right way forward. Despite me doing it. Okay, uh, and then we have reduced complexity signaling. Um, which I guess Harold mentioned is the existing requirement is too simplistic uh, due to the abuse uh, possibilities outlined in RFC 8827 uh, violet section 6.3. And then Jan Ivar asked, how is this different from WISH? Uh, and then Tim said, it's WISH is for ingest. This would be for egress. Uh, and then Jan Ivar asked whether it was the ITF, the new URI formats are for the ITF. And uh, not for the W three C. So this is uh, the the re requirement in uh, in uh, six point three was uh, very specific about revealing uh, uh, letting certain keys be under under the control of JavaScript, uh, which they would be if, if we can inject them. Uh, so, uh, so uh, adopting this case requires that we actually go understand this, what these are supposed to guard against, and why it's not a problem in this case. I mean, in the, in the wish case, I think the answer is, uh, hey, what's what's announcing the uh, what's announcing the URL is the server, and servers are big boys; they can look out for themselves, which might not be the case for a uh, for a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Now I have, I lost track of where we were not. I think Tim. Yeah, so so I think um, uh, I don't know how we um, do this, but I do think it there's a there's a set of requirements where it would be like the, uh, it would be really nice, for example, to be able to plug in a a unidirectional live feed into a, uh, a video tag with just setting the source attribute, right? In the same way that you can do that with an M3U um, URL. Now, I, I, how that, without having to drag in a bunch of infrastructure, uh, a, a bunch of JavaScript, and, 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 and I think it feels to me like that's achievable. Now, how you do it, um, and how it could be done, I don't yet know. Um, but it, I mean, wishes, and, and just the distinction with the other thing with wishes is that wish is a negotiation. Although it's a less of a negotiation, it still does a full offer answer negotiation. Um, 
I think the aim here would be more of a um, kind of declarative. This is what we're doing. Uh, one way statement. Um, so I, I'm, and it feels like it's achievable and desirable, but I, I do take the, the issue about kind of revealing things that you shouldn't be revealing and understanding why, why that may or may not be a problem. Yeah. So, uh, We will have a negotiation anyway, or a, a, an offer answer round in packets. It would be nice to not have to do an offer answer round in singly. I mean, you fire up DTLS, you have offer answer. Uh, it isn't a necessarily a negotiation, though. No, it negotiates crypto suites and so on. Nothing to do with the STP. Right, right. So you have a packet going this way, packet going that way. But we shouldn't need to have a packet going this way, around the corner, or some other media. Yeah, I mean, the... the problem has been like even in OH, something like ORTC, you still had to have an offer and an answer just to exchange the ICE creds and the DTLS creds, right? At kind of at a minimum. You couldn't uh, just do it one way and have all the have all the security properties you wanted. Um. But I think, I mean, to Harold's point about the server being a big boy, I mean, the assumption, the assumption maybe then is that one end of this is a server. Maybe that's what. That, maybe that's the restriction that make, allows us to write this. That that this that one end of this is a, is a server, and therefore there are attributes you already know, perhaps from you know um, from having talked to it before or something. So it's a more stable place, and and it can look after itself in in some respects. Um, I, I'm yeah. Um, I think we again. I think we need to, we need to find some way of kind of picking apart the things that we care about here and and, and limiting the scope of this to a to a point where it's at least well. I hope that it becomes acceptable. Yeah. So perhaps more analysis. I mean, I understand that if the DTLS certificate was already known from a previous interaction, you could probably eliminate that offer answer. I don't think you could get rid of ICE, uh, the ICE offer answer. But anyway, uh, so is the next step here more more uh, analysis? What, what do you think, Harold? So I would say that uh, the the use case should just be adopted with a with a caveat saying that uh, secure uh, that uh, secure security guarantees for the, for each other must be must be taken into considerations. Uh, but uh, but uh, so so the the way it looked currently was that it it said uh, the answer is a URI. What was the question? And I think the the question needs to be need, needs to be we want to set up a, a connection between a between two entities without having to go through a signaling server and the and the answer shouldn't be in the question right so so you're saying redraw this as a as a higher level requirement and then discuss it from there yep okay so I've, I've been think I've been think, thinking about just randomized uh, thinking and about way, ways we could do this uh, based on DNS uh, and then uh, put it into MDNS for the for the peer to peer use case inside the local network. I it right. was kind of cool, but it uh, it's not uh, it's not also it's not a solution to all problems. Yeah, I actually did a bunch of work on that years ago, uh, and it is actually tricky because you can start. There's issues, potential issues with uh, 
cash poisoning and and you know record signing and stuff like that avoiding security right. issues is, is not simple the secu Same for security you. properties of mdns are interesting yeah I mean, I, I don't want to dive into the detail of this, but I, but I think the strong point, is, as you said, Bernard, was that if we already have some sort of exchange of um, certificates that we both that the both right. sides know, then there's at least somewhere to stand, mm -hmm. um, and, and 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 maybe validate things from, or I don't know, um, use that that pivot point to 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 build the rest of it. I, I you know. Um, I take take the point that this is complicated stuff we would have to get right. Okay. So I think the next step on this one is uh, revision uh, and, and clarification, I think. Um, so why don't we get into the uh, requirements? <laughs> and if you thought it was complicated up till now, uh, <laughs> I've got another level for you. Uh, so we... I'm um, trying to summarize here the uh, comments on the individual requirements. And a bunch of them uh, were questions about whether we actually could do this already or whether we needed new stuff to do it. So for N30, it said uh, ability to reestablish media after an interruption. And my question was, do we need new APIs for this? Uh, as an example, um, you know, if, you, if your media gets... Uh, uh, interrupted, you could do more signaling to try to set it up again. You could do a nice restart. Um, I know some folks at one point implemented turn mobility, so you could bring it up pretty quickly without actually having to allocate new turn candidates. Um, you know, there's a nicer proposal from Google in the ITF, uh, which I think, Harold, didn't require any API changes, right? It just... Uh, we, have, we haven't found, found API changes so far. Right. Possibly, possibly we would, it would uh, the, the current discussion says that possibly we would uh, consider asking for a switch to turn it on and off. Right. Okay. So minimal API changes. Yeah. Um, Either that or adopt WebRTC CIS totally. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, something like that. Different so, kettle of fish. Different, different kettle of fish. So, yeah. So that was the question about N30 is, is did it have an API requirement or was there some underlying protocol thing here uh, that without an API. And then N31 was uh, so place media during an interruption. And I guess the question was, couldn't you just download the home music before the interruption and cache it and then play it? Um, uh, it wouldn't be real time, obviously, but you'd, you'd have stored it. You, you don't even have, you don't even need to download it. You could just pull it and play it. <laughs> right. Well, if you were interrupted, you wouldn't have connectivity, I guess. Uh, but, In which case, uh, you're not sending it to anyone, to anyone anyways. Well, I guess uh, I guess the browser could play it even if it's disconnected from the internet, right? If it already had it in the cache, I guess. Yes, yes, it could. Yeah. Yeah. So then the, N30, yeah. Go ahead. So N32 was about parking connections and my distant memory of SIP is there is like you, you do have parking there. Uh, so could you just do that with, uh, you know, the existing SIP signaling? Do you need anything new in the API? And then the long-term connection reestablished without access to external services. I think that gets into what we were just discussing. Um, and I was, my question was, you know, is there some kind of protocol thing you need there? Um, like you basically, your SIP signaling server is no longer accessible. Like, uh, how do you know who to trust on the LAN? Do you need some? Because MDNS isn't. I mean, how do you how do you figure that out? You're, I guess, signaling to someone else on the on the LAN, and if it's not a server, like uh, you're expecting a browser to run a HTTP server. Exactly how the, how would that work? Um, I don't know if people want to comment on these on these uh, requirements. Um, I'll clarify the, the hold music one because I think it's probably the, the one that is the least understood and the easiest to explain. Um, but the, the issue here is is that we don't that the browsers don't um, don't tell you when they when you've been interrupted in a way that ah, okay. allows you to do anything sensible. Mm. Um, like you know if you get a GSM interruption or or the the user 
put something foreground and, and you don't know, you don't know and what's even worse the other party you're talking to has absolutely no idea what's happened mm -hmm. it's indistinguishable from um losing connectivity for the first 40 seconds like you can't it's it's really hard to to for the far end to know what has just happened okay and and i think it would be really nice to be able to like just you know, hold music or whatever for, for the far end to receive, to say, so it's basically a, a mute state that carries the the idea that it might be retrievable. And and somehow that is sent to the far end and the far end can like kind of play comfort noise or whatever it is that it needs to do. So what is he somehow it gets sent to the far end? Because well, that really sounds like, sound, sound like the hardest part here. Um, well, so I think there are two parts. The, the first part is that the near end needs to needs to know what's happening. Like if the near end knew what was happening, then it could probably send something over the data channel and we could work around it that way. But what it does at the moment is it just, as far as I can tell, it just, I should probably defer to UN if or some right on this, yeah but, but but what I can as far as I can tell what it does at the moment is it just mutes the stream it mutes the audio stream right right and possibly the video stream depending on the implementation and what I'm asking for is if that mute is sent can we not like do something else as well but okay what is so it you weren't you weren't talking about a connectivity interruption you were talking about like the phone call coming in on an iPhone yeah, what is an interruption uh, here? Right. Because that's the part I don't understand. I assume it's connectivity. Yep. Uh, so in this particular one, I'm not thinking about connectivity. Um, ah, okay. So um, what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about the the GSM interrupt or um, right. or people uh, or, or the for one reason or another the OS deciding that this um, that this stream needs to be muted. Yeah, so UN, you went. You mobile. had a PR about this, right? UN, UN, you want to talk? Uh, anyway, you, UN was controlling. Dropped off. Okay, so UN has a PR about uh, the iPhone, a phone call coming in, and then you get muted as a result of that. I think that, is that what you're talking about, Tim? Yeah, I, I think he's he's addressing part of it, but uh, my hmm. concern is the far end finding out as well right okay well if i mean if you can if you, there's a way for the i mean first thing is the this the side that's, that this is happening to has to have some way to find out that this happened mm. okay when so let's assume okay. there's some way you can find out from the os or whatever okay second of all it has to be able to if we can find out that out then we would need to define some sort of event once we define some sort of event that, a, that an application can get then the application can do whatever it wants. It can switch to hold, sending hold music. It can just send a data channel me message to the other side. It's entirely within the existing APIs. Uh, it can be handled. The only thing I think that is needed is some sort of notification that that some sort of interruption of of media by the operating system has occurred. And then you have to define, figure out if, like, if the, uh, you have to worry about things like if the user just hits the mute button on their mic, does that constitute an interruption? Probably not. Okay, it has to be something that's not under the control of the user. Uh, but we could define an event for that, and then let everything else be handled by existing APIs. Yeah, I agree. This sounds like a request on media capture. It has nothing to do with peer connection per se. Uh, I'd like to comment that uh, currently, if you mute a track locally. Uh, it does not get muted remotely. It might in Chrome, but that that is a, there's a bug on that. So these are this sounds like a media capture only uh, issue that could be solved with, uh, you know, an auto band data channel message. Uh, didn't UN just submit a PR on this exact issue, Yanivar? I think he uh, used he a, have... he, it was a mute event. I think that he caused to have happen when uh, the phone call comes in and you get muted as a result on the iPhone. Yes, uh, and it's a, it's a, not a not a peer connection thing, but a media capture thing. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think I think this one the uh, thing to do, Tim, is be to revise it um, in light of uh, I think I think this may be 
uh, just to clarify what we mean by interruption, certainly, I think there was a misunderstanding about that. Um, and also for you to review UN's PR to see if that's a foundation for it or whether there's an additional requirement. Um, okay. Do you have additional comments on the, uh, before we go to the other uh, requirements? So I think this was written before NISA. Um, I think there is some overlap with NISA and, and we need to understand what, where that, uh, where that goes. Um, and whether whether NISA meets that requirement, and then the, the You're thinking about thirty three, hmm? thirty I think, and thirty is yeah. I think he's talking about. Yeah, and and then on uh, on thirty three, uh, I think the we need to we probably need to come up with some limitations on on like that the two have already like met. That this is this is thirty three is only achievable if, well, no, actually, it's kind of reviving it. So they already know each other. So there's there's some some things that you could you can preassume potentially. So with thirty three, why uh, under what circumstances that need to be reestablished? You, you've been isolated from the wider net, but if the call is already up. How does it, how you know why does it you need to have access to the wider net? Uh, you don't want so so this crops up with um, with user has for example a baby monitor and a, and a, a smartphone and uh -huh. at the moment um, they all write native apps because they can't reestablish communication if the uh, if their ISP is down. So they do tricksy things with MDNS and local stuff. And well, it, this isn't really reestablishing a call. This is establishing a new call to to a, to a to a, something you've or you've talked to in the past. Uh, yeah, the assumption I think was that well, the, the, there's also like two IoT devices that maybe want to talk to each other, or an I, you want to talk to an IoT device a day later. Um, so you may not keep that connection up. Maybe right. that's to do with like what it's, it's establishing a new connection to something you talked to before. Um, it depends on how you define a new connection, because I think in a lot of cases, this is going to be an extension of an existing connection. Like there are some properties of the existing connection that you can assume are still valid. Uh, and hopefully that makes it simpler to, to deliver. Okay. I, I think there's some terminology issues definitions that need to be nailed down here to make sure it's clear what we're what we're actually talking about because it, it's definitely not clear from the from the current text right um, and uh, yeah the yeah I'm just trying to think of what's yeah yeah Okay, why don't we uh, look at the remaining requirements? And uh, so we also had comments on N34, 35, and 36. Uh, 34 was, I guess, back to what Yoniver said about the pre-connection service workers. N35 um, was, the question was, can we handle this with mesh? Um, so you don't always need a media server to do a conference. You, you can do that today with what we're see in a mesh. And then there was a whole bunch of comments on autoplay um, being messy. And I certainly sympathize with that. Uh, uh, and there were questions about the autoplay attribute. And actually, I wanted to point out, Yanivar said the autoplay is outside of the scope of what you see. It's, it's actually in the media working group. And in fact, they are trying to do some fixes to it. Uh, and this autoplay issue one was one example of, uh, of fixes. Um, so I think, um, so that was a comment on N36. And then for 37, 38, and 39, um, and then 37, the question was, is this, do we need new DRM stuff or can we use the existing DRM stuff we have? And if something new is required, what is it? And then uh, Jan Eber had his questions about new DRM things and whether to see your data channels. N38 was the subtitle assets. And I guess 
we had the question of can't we already do this like by just downloading the subtitle assets over data channel is there some what is it uh, and then n39 was the same thing we talked about the uri formats uh, with the uh, issues in ADA 27 and the ITF handling of URI formats. So do we have comments on these? So I'll just talk about the mesh thing. The idea here was, I think we're actually quite close to being able to do this um, already um, as, as, as um, but the idea is is that you don't necessarily need a mesh. You you might want to you might want to be a you might want to star. Um, like there's no need to do a full mesh if all you want to do is essentially send out the teacher to students. Um, the students don't need to talk to each other necessarily, or don't need to see each other. But the teacher may may need to see everybody and be seen by everybody. So you might want to build a star here and the media that you're sending to the students is the same for all of them. So can you make some optimizations about um, only encoding it once? Because it turns out if you like the, the huge overhead on, in, on sending out like 40 streams um, is encoding it 40 times, which you didn't need to do. Um, so that that's where that comes from. But I think actually we're surprisingly close with, with the insertable stream stuff. We're really surprisingly close to being able to do that as it is. Um, I, I but if we had a requirement that it was possible, then uh, like if there's a slip on the, uh, we, might, we might ensure that that becomes possible, if you see what I mean. Yeah, as an example, like if you use web codecs uh, and then encrypted the payload, you, uh, you could certainly send that over data channel. I mean, you'd have to send it as, you know, to each of the students separately but you wouldn't have to change, you wouldn't have to encode it a zillion times or encrypt it a zillion times. So is that what you're talking about? It is, but I didn't want to do it over the data channel. Oh, okay, okay. so not over the data channel. Okay. Right. I wouldn't uh, want Tough. to assume that is. Uh, requirements shouldn't be talking about whether it's on the data channel, uh, UDP transport, web transport, or um, by black magic. Requirements, talk about requirements. So one thing about uh, sending stuff uh, to multiple people, and particularly the case that Tim was talking about, uh, is um, that's all well and good to say, oh, I'll just encode it once and send it to everyone until you have bandwidth issues mm -hmm. and latency issues and retransmit issues. And, you know, I, I missed... I missed a keyframe. I need a I need a refresh issue, and so uh, yes, you can do this, but it is not anywhere near as straightforward as it sounds like, uh, whether it's over data channels or otherwise. Um, uh, at minimum, if you're going to support this in in any sort of general form, you need to encode at multiple different bandwidths or be ready to encode at multiple different bandwidths as, as needed, as told by the, by the, by the, by the receivers. Um, and you need to handle recovery uh, from all those in like, you know, for example, if one misses an iframe, you may have to send it to all of them, or all that are sharing a particular substream. So it's, it's messy and complicated. And, and so I think if you're going to talk about it, you need to talk about, you know, in more detail, what is actually going to be required in, in this case? Uh, you and Harold have just given completely diametric advice. Um, Harold has said he shouldn't be talking about how this works, and you just said you should well, talk about how this works. I mean, I, 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 I totally I get that it has to be done at some point. Like, both things have to be done at some point, but, I, but I'm not sure what the takeaway activity is from this now. I'm not saying you have to define those things. I'm saying it's complex and you can't figure out a solution to it without having a more detailed explanation of what you're trying to get. Well, so let me try to bridge the two. I, I've actually trying to write code to, as an example of what Randall just said. It is extremely complex. Um, however, I will say that in the web uh, uh, API model, we're getting more and more of the things you need to do, like in web codecs, you can do SVC, you know, you can do all this stuff. What I'm just trying to understand is, because this is a requirement, what what stuff 
what exactly I need to do to make this possible that isn't possible now. That That's all I'm trying to get. And, and maybe that's what Harold is asking for. Uh, I'm just trying to understand, you know, you said that we're nearly there, and I think I agree with that, but I'm not sure what's missing to get us there. Yeah. And I think, I think to do that, you need to define with some real detail what there is. What is the actual case that you want to cover and what are the what are the limits of that case because you can't define a solution until you know what your the limits of this you know, you're going to cover are mm, so i think yeah um i i'm struggling slightly with the idea that we that we have to work through a in order to state a user requirement, we have to work through exactly how it would work and say which bits. I mean, the, the, the goal in stating this user requirement for me was to ensure that the other work that we do in the other places, which might very nearly make this work, will do that extra centimeter, that extra API, one extra API point that makes this requirement work. Mm. And And so... Like I said, we I suspect we're very, very nearly there already. Like we just added keyframes. Like, you know, like right. the, a lot of the things that you're talking about are are things that we're very close to to already having. And I think that putting in a a a, um, a use case here, which says this is something we'd like to be able to achieve, is it is uh, provides a guideline for the other things that we're doing to make sure that those API points do meet this this need and and I, I i totally take your point that all of these things will need to be done in order to deliver that but i don't think they all have to be defined at this point in this document yeah. and i'm not disagreeing oh, I, I agree with, i agree with you I I just, we're set, right. seven minutes left i i largely agree with you but i'm saying in or not saying that we have to define the solution i'm saying we have to define the problem we're solving Okay. And that's the thing is, I think it's just a little too vague as to what the problem we're solving is here. As Harold just said, we're six minutes away. Yeah. Uh, and what we'd like to try to do, I think, in the six minutes remaining is figure out exactly what our next steps are um, and, and what we do to kind of move this along. Um, so I think we've had a really good discussion, uh, but we need to kind of come to come to agreement on what to do next for these requirements. Um, Harold, do you have any thoughts? So I think we, I think we should uh, remove stuff that uh, is obviously not our problem, like uh, autoplay. Autoplay, OK. Yeah, I think we should uh, uh, clearly re refine the use cases uh, up front so, so that they're more clear about what they, how, I mean, I mean they, they should be clear enough that we should, we know whether we have achieved them or not. And uh, the requirements here, uh, I mean, mostly, uh, I'm not, I'm unhappy with uh, 34 too because it seems to be uh, mostly out, uh, either trivial or out of scope. Mm. And so uh, I would I would uh, go another round of uh, editing the ones that ones that are left and say and try to make them more precise precise enough that we can uh, can tell whether they are already satisfied or whether they will be satisfied once. Uh, so I have a question done. about that precision. Is that precision in terms of what the user will be experiencing, or is it precision in terms of what we will be providing in, in terms of APIs, or is it precision in terms of what do we have to change in the browser? Like, because there are, there are three levels of precision here, and I'm, I think, I mean, I'm, an, I'm a newbie at this, and I think I'm getting it, getting it wrong, so I need guidance on what, yeah. what you mean by precision. And in this in this case, since this is use cases, I would say, uh, I would say that it's about what the user experience, what we're able to build, so that the user has a certain experience. 
I mean, we can't uh, we can't do everything. Uh, we we can't uh, build a, a polished application as a, as part of the standards work. That's not our business. But uh, we got to convince ourselves that once it's once we have satisfied the use case, it's possible to give the user the experience that we want to give him or her or it. Yeah, so that's for the use case. For a requirement, what I want is I want to know if I've done it or not. Yeah. So like with N35, I think if you showed this to the Web Codex folks, they, they might think that Web Codex plus data channel satisfied it or some maybe with some WASM or something, they might be able to do all the things that Randall referred to. Um, but I want to be able to determine whether I've done it or not. Um, and what if, if not, what's missing? And then that's what I'm confused about for some of these. I don't know whether I have it or not, or what's, what exactly I'd need to do to get it. So I'm, I'm inclined to say that we, that I can take on the thing of, of rewriting the user, uh, the user use case, the user experience stuff and, 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 and taking on board the comments that we've had about what it is we're trying to achieve here and, 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 in some cases, why existing solutions don't work. Um, I think I struggle much more with with getting the the, the detailed requirements um, right, and I'm kind of inclined maybe to do an iteration without even addressing those for the moment, and just mm -hmm. make sure we agree what the use cases are. That yeah, would make me happy. Yeah, I think that's the right priority, certainly. Uh, yeah, I would agree. Uh, I'm on the queue. So I was just going to say that uh, uh, for use cases, uh, it's not like we're starting from scratch. We have a mature respect here. So I think what I took away the most from was when you phrase things as we tried to do, here's what we tried, because people are using things, WebRTC for things that we hadn't predicted. So uh, there would be a use case would be, we tried to do this with WebRTC and here are the obstacles we encountered. And uh, I think that's helpful. Like when you said, you know, uh, we had to encode multiple times, for example. Oh, that, that sounds like you can do it, but it's just not fast enough. So that's an optimization and so forth. So a little more about the obstacles that you found with WebRTC, and then that should help drive the requirements too and narrow it down to, you know, overcoming specific obstacles perhaps. Okay, we are actually uh, at the one o'clock uh, hour uh, Eastern. Um, so I think we're done. Hopefully uh, we have a, uh, a way forward. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And yeah. uh, have a happy, happy new year and great holidays. I'd like to send, thank Ben for putting up with all that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you very much, folks. And thank see you all in January. Good seeing you. Bye. The next meeting is January 18th. Thank you. See you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.